someone says we go with C, vacuum uh, sampling dryer. For example, a rotary cone vacuum dryer uses conduction as the main. I model. think it's. Uh, I. Yes. Okay. Um. So a rotary vacuum cone dryer uses conduction as the main mode of heat transfer, while a freeze dryer uses sublimation as the mode of heat removal. So uh, vacuum, the person says we go with uh, vacuum tumbling dryer. So what do you guys think? And what are the drying methods? We can discuss that also. Yeah, it can be uh, C, although I, I saw someone saying uh, D for microwave. I think for microwave, um, like I'm seeing that the microwaves are, uh, they, they penetrate into the material and then the, the microwaves are converted to heat, while for vacuum drying, these uh, heat transfer in in vacuum drying and it's and it's usually by conduction. So I guess I think I think C would be the appropriate. Okay. So yeah, anybody with a different answer? Uh, why not A? I mean, yeah. Treat. Try um I'm not I sure. would also say it's uh, uh I would also go with A. Okay. Anyone else with another opinion? So the the other okay. types. I've, I've seen to... that dry dry uses a convective heat transfer to flow heated air over solids to dry them, and we have uh, three waves or uh, three methods. Yeah, so you can have a conduction that is direct contact, and it's the direct flow of heat through a material resulting from physical contact, while convection is via fluid. So heat transfer between a surface and an adjacent fluid and by the flow of fluid from one place to another induced by temperature. And radiation is the last one. So it's basically the transfer of thermal energy through matter of space by electromagnetic waves. These are three methods of heat transfer. So is three one of them? the one that utilizes conduction to transfer or not? It uses convention. Convention, okay. So the answer is three instead of vacuum. Yeah. But it's in conduction. Oh. For tray, it uses convention. For vacuum dryer, it uses conduction. Okay. So yeah. what I found for vacuum dryer, uh, tumble dryer, it uses uh, trays to hold the materials to be dried and the vacuum pump reduces pressure. Steam is then passed between the trays and jackets through tightly closed dryer door and it transfers heat through conduction. So it should be C as mentioned before.
So. We go with the vacuum or tray dryer. We can all give our opinions. I think I'll go with vacuum. Mm -hmm. Okay, for three, we had said that it's conventional, not conduction. So, conduction to heat transfer. I think C is still the appropriate answer if we're talking about conduction. Okay. So we can just come back to it then again later or we can um, because people have different answers. Yeah, we can just come back to that question. Which of the following is not an advantage? Uh, freeze drying, good for drying volatile compounds, good porosity of the product, reduce risk of oxidation during drying, and reduce risk of hydrolysis during drying. Option B. Mm -hmm. What are the uh, overall advantages of freeze drying first? It's not a, yeah, so we can go through the advantages and the disadvantages of freeze drying. I think, okay, I think A, usually the freeze drying, what I remember is most mostly for those biologically, biological uh, preparations, which are heat sensitive. So I would think uh, it's not for volatile compounds, I, if I've not forgotten. Mm. Okay. So um, the advantages of scent to the crew. Okay, I think to... uh, A is an advantage because freeze drying can be used. It's like an alternative method for analysis for like volatile organic compounds. Mm -hmm. And also B is an advantage. Yeah, B is an advantage. Yeah, reduce risk of oxidation during dry. Does it reduce oxidation? And then D, reduce risk of hydrolysis during drying. So I think D, it's D. Yeah. So I'm seeing some advantages of free freeze drying. It's uh low temperatures to you can use lower temperatures and then adapt it to oxygen sensitive products. If it's oxygen sensitive products, that means it's reduced risk of oxidation, right? Yeah. And then uh, high porosity and controlled moisture content. So it's 
Okay, I'm also not sure about A, so it's either A or D. So if it's like uh, that, uh, it says closing vials under the inert gas is adapted to oxygen sensitive product. Does that mean it's reducing oxidation? Yes, to my understanding, that I think that's what it means. Okay, let's see. We can all search and then give our opinions. Um, can can someone explain about the good porosity of the product? Like I I did not understand that. How is that an advantage? I think when it has good um, porosity, it will increase the solubility and dissolution, therefore increasing the bioavailability. So I searched, it says freeze drying is known to extend the shelf life of foods by preventing the microbial growth and retarding lipid oxidation. So that means it does reduce the risk of oxidation. So C is out also. What do you guys think? I think it's the hydrolysis is most of the time hydrolysis occurs if the method you're using involves water or high temperatures. With low temperatures, your compound is just being like frozen, then it means it doesn't like literally basically interact with water or something like that. If you're using what is it called? The low the freeze drying, I think would be good for drying volatile compounds. So personally, I would think the answer would be D, because hydrolysis then would be involved in if you're drying using high temperatures or your method involves water. Oh yeah, makes sense. Okay. Then you can go with D. Is that okay with everyone? Yes. Okay. Um, Shrina, you can mark that as D. Uh, all the following are complications of diabetes uh, meditas except uh, retinopathy, nephropathy, neuropathy and uh, osteoporosis so as we know the retinopathy like uh, nephro and neuro are one of the like the three complications of diabetes mellitus so it doesn't uh, it doesn't cause osteoporosis in any way okay for question then, 48 mm -hmm. i'm finding that the uh the same one of the disadvantages of using uh, freeze drying is actually that some material may be lost, uh, some volatile material may be lost. So I think A is the most is the most accurate answer from the sources that I'm finding. I can just okay. share this with. So, but um, hydrolysis involves heat. That was what was said. Okay, let me read something about it. Freeze drying is also known as lyophilization. It is the process in which water in the form of ice under low pressure is removed from a material by sublimation. So, during freeze drying, water in the form of ice is removed okay water in the form of ice under low pressure is removed from the material by sublimation so the, the the material being dried doesn't have water because water is being removed by sublimation 
So it is an advantage. I think so. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? And I think the answer is A for 48. Drying, um, drying takes place at very low temperature, so the chemical decomposition, particularly hydrolysis, is, mi is minimized. Yeah, okay, okay you can do it. Mm -hmm. Okay, I've checked slide share. And then the advantages of freeze drying is drying takes place at low temperatures, so chemical decomposition, particularly hydrolysis, is minimized. The porous form of the drug gives ready gives ready solubility, so B is correct there. Then uh, the process takes place under high vacuum, so there's little contact with air, and oxidation is minimized. So the other three are true. We are sure they are true. So the process of elimination, I think A would be the answer. Okay. And again, yeah. and again, freeze drying is an alternative method for the analysis of volatile organic compounds. So you're still lost. I don't know what the answer is. Okay, and then the you can just put a mark on that question so that it come back to it. Then at the end of it, you can all see what you got. Because like the answers are contradicting in themselves, yeah. So back to diabetes. Uh, so the long term, the complications of diabetes, these short term complications and long term complications does anyone want to take us through that? And their management, please. Okay, for the acute complications, there's usually hypoglycemia, there's hyper or smaller hyperglycemic state, and there's the diabetes ketoacidosis. For hyperglycemia, as it is, it's high blood sugar. So uh, it can happen like if the person uh, is, is taking high doses of the anti-diabetic medications, or if you don't take food after the shot, insulin uh, injections and if like you exercise um so the there will be hypo hypoglycemia i mean sorry and then for treatment we can use uh we can use glucose we can um, give glucose or you can give uh, i am of subcutaneous glucagon it will be administered um and then to avoid uh, the patient uh, what is it called in the the patient from vomiting we can give uh, the glu when we give the glucose injection the patient should be rolled on his or her side the other short term complication is diabetic ketoacidosis anyone who wants to take us through that Okay, so for keto, uh, diabetic ketoacidosis, it just technically means when the body is using uh, lipids as a source of energy due to lack of insulin. So that will cause uh, ketone bodies that will lead to acidosis. So uh, for treatment is uh, uh, re reversing the underlying metabolic abnormalities if that is, there is an underlying metabolic abnormality, you normalize the serum glucose and you also rehydrate the patient. So for fluid replacement, we use normal saline and also um, you, should, uh, you should admit the patient to the hospital. 
uh, if the pH is greater than seven or unconscious, you assess serum electrolytes because it's a metabolic uh, abnormality. Uh, you replace the fluids using cell uh, normal saline, and also um, you use regular insulin to um, to treat it. And then the other one is hyposmolar hyperglycemic state, uh, which occurs in older patients. So uh, for treatment, you use aggressive rehydration now, and you correct electrolyte imbalances, and you give continuous insulin infusion to normalize serum, serum glucose. The long-term complications include ret diabetic retinopathy, there's uh, peripheral neuropathy, there's uh, auto autonomic neuropathy, and uh, what else? Diabetic foot ulcers. Yeah, so maybe you guys can give your ideas and your intakes on the management of the Diabetic foot ulcers, nef nephropathy, retinopathy, and those ones. Uh, Lugal, I have a question for the DKA. What are the three ketones that are usually implicated? Like the, they are usually this three. Acetone, mm -hmm. hydro, hydro, hydroxyacetone, I think. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The third one, beta something, uh, let me just confirm for you, I'm not sure. I think it's, uh, we have acetone, 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 and beta hydroxybutyric acid. Yeah, as he has said, acetone, acetone, acetate, and beta hydroxy, beta red. The third one is beta? Beta hydroxy, beta red. Uh, then maybe on the uh, complications, we have uh, macrovascular complications and, and microvascular complications. So retinopathy, neuropathy, uh, nephropathy, and diabetic food is for my microvascular complications. But for macrovascular complications, we'll have things like coronary heart disease and, and other cardiomyopathies. Under the management. I think mainly the management is more of a preventative, not to get that uh, where you have uh, this diabetic uh, implication. So good, uh, optimize, you know, optimize the, the glucose control. So there's no formation of those uh, uh, the glycated uh, end products. Okay. And what are the anti? We had covered insulin uh, medications. Someone can also take us through uh anti diabetic med medications. Sorry, Fatish, you asked for what? For medication for? Yeah, the anti-diabetic, the oral medications, since insulin we had covered before. Oh, okay. So I think the first ones would be the sulfonyl ureas. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, sorry, the the sulfonyl uh, ureas, which increase uh, insulin secretion, 
such as uh, gliburide, gliplizide, glimepiride. Then you have um, the, meg the megalitides, which also increase insulin uh, secretion. That one, an example would be uh, repaglinide. Then um, there is the the incretins, which uh, again they uh, release uh, insulin from yeah basically in uh, increase the in the secretion of insulin, and for for these ones is that um, they usually uh, slow gastric gastric emptying. And they also reduce uh, appetite. And uh, one example would be uh, liraglutide. Then you have metformin, which is the bigunides. For these ones, they just improve the insulin sensitivity on on our for our cells. Then you have the the gliptins, which inhibit uh, dipeptidyl. Uh, dipeptidyl peptidase 4 yeah dipeptidyl peptidase 4 so they're inhibitors of that enzyme which increase which increases uh incretin so therefore increasing insulin secretion example would be citagliptin or vildagliptin and one thing about this is they can cause uh <clears throat> cough or nasopharyngitis because they don't uh is it they don't degrade substance substance p and bradykinin they don't degrade it or they degrade it one of them i'm not too sure about that i think they don't degrade it yeah then you have the thiazoli some that thai or something like uh, pio, pioglitazone or rosiglitazone. And uh, these ones, again, they just, um, they mostly uh, decrease lipogenolysis. So they don't have any, any effect on like insulin secretion. So usually this, this drugs take long to work because, um, because they work like they modify gene expression. So it takes longer for them to work. Yeah, I think, I think that's it. Okay, I think that's a good summary. Thank you, Miran. Uh, which of the following is used to assess renal function? Creatine, very low density lipoprotein, anemia, and uh, and gerontival hyper hyperplasia. So this is uh, creatine levels are used to assess renal function. Uh, a drug with beneficial effects to patients with kidney disease is propanol, captopril, nephedipine, atenanol. So, um, what do you guys think? Captopril. Oh, sorry, you said captopril. Captopril, yeah, as we had discussed, is an AC inhibitor. So it has uh, renal protective uh, effects. Yeah, so we can go with B. Myocardial infarction. Uh, may be uh may be detected by measuring the level of creatine kinase thyrotoxin aspartate trismenase and trip so it's creatine kinase the mb the mb1 
right? If I'm not wrong. Yeah. The LD ISO ISO form of uh, cracking kindness. Um for unstable there's a difference in the measuring of the enzymes. In angina, unstable angina, angina, myocardial stemi and unstemi. Someone can tell us about that. The difference of what? Like the when the enzymes are elevated in unstable angina, stable angina, the stemi and unstemi. Uh, maybe Hiral can confirm, but uh, what she she differentiated between the two was that in angina or in ischemic heart disease, we don't have troponin being elevated. But in myocardial infarction, both STEMI and non-STEMI, that the troponin is elevated. Yes, that's true. Yeah, also for uh, non-stem is where we don't have the ST elevation, right? And non-stem is uh, elevation. Uh, and also in non-stem, the, the artery is not completely occluded and non-stem, the artery is fully occluded. Is that right? Uh, very yeah. right, Dr. Very right. Okay, uh, we can discuss. Someone can tell us the management of myocardial infarction. Uh, so for myocardial infarction, uh, first things first, you... You want to give um, this that uh, mnemonic known as MONA. You give morphine for the pain, oxygen for to ensure adequate saturation, nitroglycerin for its vasodilatory activity, and aspirin for its uh, antiplatelet activity. So MONA, that is acutely. Then as while in transit, this patient will now be rushed to the uh, operating room where the percutaneous intervention will be done, whereby we will place a stent on the coronary artery, on the affected coronary artery, and we will start the patient on dual antiplatelet therapy, that is aspirin and clopidogrel for a year, then they'll continue aspirin for the rest of their life. We'll also start the patient on a beta blocker within the first 24 hours and on an AS inhibitor or, or an ARB. Yeah, yeah, to, to prevent future occurrence, right, of the infection. I think that's all I remember from Dr. Hiral's class. That's a nice summary. Also, we can use the calcium channel blockers to relieve the ischemic symptoms only, and then it's discontinued. And then for patients who don't tolerate aspirin, you can give them who are allergic to aspirin, um, clopidogrel. Then the 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 first dose of um, Aspirin is higher, it's 162 to 325 mg, and the maintenance for lifetime is 75 to 120. Okay, and also you can, uh, you can uh, for long term management, you can change the modifiable factors like smoking, 
overweight, inactivity, long enough, like all that, you can change those factors. You can like lose weight and do that for the modifiable factors to help in management of long term. Okay, our next question, which of the following is an pharmacological therapeutic approach to managing heart failure? Dietary sodium restriction, yeah. Uh, dietary protein restriction, increased physical activity, increased fluid intake. So for heart failure, we restrict sodium restriction and also we restrict fluid intake because of the... Um, we, we, yeah, we, we should take... Uh, Less fluid, less fluid intake. What are the other non pharmacological approaches to managing heart failure? Someone, I might is just a question for option. I'm agreeing with you that the answer is. Uh, sodium restriction. Uh, what about option C? What uh, what do we advise patients with a heart failure? Like, I know we are not telling them to exercise like they are running a uh a hundred meter race, but on physical activity, should be, uh, is there like do we advise on some exercise or something like that? Okay. For, we can use the relaxation exercises to reduce the reduction, mm -hmm. but like uh, an exercise that require too much energy or something, the heart can take that. Yeah, yeah. So simple exercises, but now the main answer here will go with dietary sodium restriction because that's one of the main pharmacological ah. treatment of heart failure. Ah. Yeah. Ah, okay, okay. I think. Yeah, and also uh, we can do smoke. You can stop smoke, quit smoking. That will help in reduce, redu um, improving the heart health and reducing more, more uh, damage. We can do weight management, fluid mo monitoring. We don't advise patients with heart failure to, we don't increase fluid intake because the heart cannot take in that removal of the, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and then you can also stop uh, alcohol, reduce stress reduction, as I said, with the relaxation um, exercises. Yeah, that's it for me. Anyone else who has? I think you were exhausted for the non-pharmacological. Okay. And for the uh, pharmacological treatment of heart failure? Well, pharmacologically, it depends on what stage the patient is on. If it's stage A where uh, the patient can do physical or in physical activity without getting any symptoms, they can be given either ACE inhibitors or ARBs. For stage B, they can be given ACE inhibitors or ARBs and also a beta blocker. For stage C, you give them uh, diuretics, ACE inhibitors, beta blockers. And for stage uh, D, now that's like end of life care because that's now even at rest, they have all these uh, heart failure symptoms. So either a heart transplant or end of life care. Yeah. Okay, that's... Uh... And then maybe so just the, lean toward. Mm -hmm, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, is that in stage? Also, the stage three is whereby is also your stage for starting the digoxy. Yeah, and also the other thing I saw somewhere is that uh, you only give diuretics when it's when there's been some congestion when there's when it's now congestive heart failure. Yeah, you don't just you don't give diuretics if there is no congestion, if there is no sign of edema, if there is no sign of uh, if there is 
if there is positive sign that the patient is still adequately controlling their fluids, you don't need to give the diuretics. Yeah. And the um, preferred diuretics is loop diuretics, right? What really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The loop, yeah, the rosemide especially, yeah. What's is there any specific reason? I think it's because they are they they are the high ceiling diuretics. They are the potent oh. diuretics. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. um as mm -hmm. yeah, as the drugs uh heral seed. So for heart failure, we can remember with a mnemonic A B A L for A stands for AC inhibitor, or A B is a heral seed, B for beta blocker. A for aldosterone antagonist, such as prenolactone, and then uh, L for loop diuretics, because specifically we use loop diuretics in this case, as you have said. And for aldosterone, aldosterone antagonist, loop diuretics, and AC inhibitors, you should monitor the UAEs closely for electrolyte uh, um, disturbance. Yeah. So next question, 54, the most common predisposing factor for chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. Can go, please go up. Uh, cigarette smoking, yeah, alcohol consumption, genetic predisposition, malnutrition. So the most common is cigarette smoking, so we all know. Yes. Yeah. Among okay. guys, you know, Sima? Uh, no, I'm learning, I'm learning, I'm learning. Okay, yeah, it's the smoking is usually the leading cause of COPD. We can talk about COPD starting with the risk factors or the predisposing factors. Uh, for COPD, now, as the mm -hmm. as the as the name suggests, it's a chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. So the we we of course expecting that there is some obstruction in the lungs, but uh, before we get there, maybe the divergent is the of course smoking, as uh, Doctor has said. And then the other thing that can lead to COPD is a condition whereby there's this thing called alpha antitrypsin deficiency. If there's deficiency of that particular enzyme, AAT, it's also one of the factors or it can also come in as a cause for COPD. Uh, and of course, there's some aspect of genetics. So... Uh, the other thing is maybe to mention is that uh, it's not only cigarette smoke. You know, cigarette sounds like tobacco. Even other things like marijuana and other forms of tobacco, I you know, things like shisha, they also do increase the risk for COPD. It's not only cigarette smoking. You know, when you say cigarette, someone may think it's only tobacco. Yeah. So essentially, with the what happens in COPD is that because uh, let's start starting with the cigarette smoking, you know, it leads to some oxidative stress. The oxidative stress leads to an inflammatory response, which eventually will cause some pathological changes that will include the mucus to be hypersecreted by the lungs or rather by the goblet cells lining the epithelium of the lungs, there'll be this ciliary dysfunction whereby particles, we know the cilia, they're always wafting towards the nose, like pushing anything coming down towards the nose. But because of that mucus hypersecretion, the cilia are not able to function properly. And uh, uh, what it eventually leads to is a situation whereby the alveoli once you once you exhale, the alveoli collapses on itself instead of 
instead of staying elastic, the alveoli collapses on itself. So the biggest problem with COPD is not inhaling, is that these people are not able to exhale adequately. So in short, they are not exhaling as much CO2 as they should, leading to acidosis. And of course, as the CO2 builds up, there's no space for oxygen. Hence, there'll be some dif uh, there'll be some difficulty in gas exchange leading to the low oxygen concentration in the blood. One last thing about COPD is that it can lead to this uh, pulmonary hypertension, which leads to a condition known as core pulmonale, right-sided heart failure. Yeah, maybe someone else can talk about treatment. Nice summary. To add on that, also I... these passive passive smokers are affected. Like, if you have had long term exposure to cigarette smoking in childhood, that can be a risk factor COPD, not just the active smokers. Yeah. Go on, please. I wanted to add on the uh, etiology. You can also have environmental pollutants or occupational dust, chemicals, and even genetic factor plays a role. Did I interrupt somebody talking? Ah, no, it was your time. It was your time, Shina. Oh, okay. Then uh, maybe if we could even look at the diagnosis. Uh, you can do a physical exam and also take a medical history and pulmonary function tests like uh, spirometry uh, and it will also have reduced levels of FEV1 and FVC chest x-ray and also arterial blood gas uh, like you said there will be decreased uh, partial pressure for oxygen and increased for oxy carbon dioxide and that will lead to decreased pH. Uh, for management, uh, non-pharmacologically, we have smoking cessation, um, pulmonary rehabilitation. You can have oxygen uh, therapy. Uh, I'm not sure, but maybe vaccination like annually for influenza or pneumococcal vaccine. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and uh, pharmacologically, you have the bronchodilators like beta adrenergic agonists. Uh, uh, you have the short acting and the long acting. The short acting, you have the albuterol. Long acting, you have the formoterol. Then uh, you can have anticholinergics that will decrease the bronchoconstriction. Uh, here you can use ipratropium or uh, tiotropium. Then inhaled corticosteroids like fluticasone, or you could use a combination of inhalers that contain both bronchodilator and a corticosteroid. And sometimes you can use phosphodiesterase for inhibitors like your filin. I think that's it. And then they're classified into four stages according to um, the first expiratory volume. So the first stage is um, greater than 80%. That's mild. The second stage is moderate, 50 to 79% predicted. The third stage is severe, 30 to 49% of the first expiratory volume. And then the fourth stage is very severe, less than 30%. Yeah. And then for corticosteroids, you don't use them for long because of the rebound effect of corticosteroid in health corticosteroids. Yeah, yeah Hiral is also mentioning that... Uh... It's, uh, it's characterized by two major things, that is chronic bronchitis and emphysema. Okay, that's a good summary. Can, can I go on or someone else has 
something to add on that. Maybe they can just uh, give us a small, in, uh, I don't know how to call it, how you can differentiate with, uh, between bronchitis and emphysema. Yeah, someone do that. Okay, so COPD is like chronic bronchitis and emphysema, like I think together or no, not together, but yeah one of the two so for chronic bronchitis um usually uh there's right heart right side heart failure um there's usually a productive uh, cough or wheezing while for emphysema it's a mild cough with less uh, wheezing um for uh, chronic bronchitis the patients are usually called uh, blue blotters because of cyanosis, while for emphysema, it's, they're called uh, pink puffers. Then also um, for chronic bronchitis, um, like the patients have this obese type appearance, while uh, for emphysema, it's like a, a thin barrel chest. And then uh, for, for chronic bronchitis, there is secondary polycythemia, while uh, for emphysema, there is uh, like hypercapnia because those lungs, like uh, Guy said, the alpha-1 uh, antitryp antitrypsin deficiency causes, uh, like the lungs cannot collapse so they, the person cannot inhale properly. Uh, exhale properly so there's that oxygen I mean I mean carbon dioxide buildup so that causes hypercapnia or air trapping yeah I think I think that's yeah. how you would nice uh for 55 the antidote for paracetamol poisoning we had done uh antidotes so it's uh, acetyl cysteine Paridoxime is for organic phosphate. Sodium bicarbonate, I think, was for sodium something blockers. The sodium channel. That one, I'm not sure. Correct me if I'm wrong. For the foraxime, it was ion poisoning. Sodium bicarbonate is aspirin, I think. Poisoning. Yeah, it's a general drug. And sometimes, yeah, basic acidic drugs most of the time. Aspirin being an example. Okay, so we had covered antidotes, so that's a good addition to or remind uh reminder which of the following tests is used to determine uh rhythm disturbances of the heart, echocardiogram. Cardi and cardiac catheterization, electrocardiogram, and, ex and exercise stress testing. So uh, it's echocardiogram. Electrocardiogram. Is it electrocardiogram or echocardiogram? Electrocardiogram. The ECG echo is for cardiac output. Oh, yeah, ECG is for the rhythm electrocardiogram. Yeah, oh. uh, heparin induced bleeding is treated with vitamin K. Actually, protamine sulfate, right? And, and then vitamin K is for the warfarin. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah. Sorry. We had we talked about uh, heparin and the mechanism of actions? I, I, I don't think we had encountered the, uh, the anticoagulants anywhere. Mm. Then you yeah. can talk about that. Starting with the and then anticoagulants and then we can also do the fibrinolytics.
Aya, anticoagulants. Anticoagulants. 50 participants. Someone must know something on anticoagulants. Okay. Oh, yeah, the question is uh, anticoagulants. We're talking about their mechanism of action, the types. Someone can take us through that. Mm. Okay, I can give some general information on warfarin. Okay, go on. Warfarin is an oral anticoagulant. Usually, uh, it takes about two to five days for it to work once administered. And its mechanism of action is usually through the inhibition of uh, the vitamin K epoxide uh, reductors. So basically, it inhibits uh, incorporation. Uh, I'm not sure if it's incorporation. It inhibits the action of uh, vitamin K in the synthesis of, I think, factor two. Uh, what do you call it? Prothrombin, I think, yeah. I'm not sure. Uh, yeah. So by inhibiting that uh, process, it usually prevents uh, coagulation. So as you said, initially, uh, its antidote is usually vitamin K. Oh. Mm -hmm, OK. So that's the vitamin K epoxide reductase inhibitor for Just because of the other classes. Uh, can we uh, remind ourselves of the uh, the clotting part with the intrinsic and extrinsic? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we can. I think uh, that's best done with an image. Uh, I hope someone will send an image of the group while we're at it. But uh, starting with the ex extrinsic, extrinsic pathway, extrinsic pathway will have uh, once an injury has occurred, we'll have tissue factor will be released from the tissues and the tissue factor will con will activate factor seven. So factor seven will become factor seven A or factor seven activated. So the activated factor seven will act on factor 10 to become factor 10A. And then factor 10A is what will convert prothrombin to thrombin, thrombin fibrinogen to fibrin, fibrin will uh hold the platelets together leading to formation of that platelet plug so the extrinsic pathway it's the shortest because we just have factor seven after factor seven when we go to factor 10 that is the common pathway so extrinsic we just have factor seven and okay and factor three because tissue factor is i think it's also called factor three if i'm not wrong yeah then mm -hmm. uh-huh yeah, you're right. It's factor three. Ah, uh, yeah. So then, uh, so warfarin works on the extrinsic pathway, and number two is that the extrinsic pathway is measured using the PT, the prothrombin time. When we come to the intrinsic pathway, we'll see we measure it using the APTT. Yeah, and I snore has sent a nice photo. Yeah, then for now, the intrinsic pathway, we just, it, it's, it's the one that is in descending order, that uh, it starts with when there is damage, now to, and then collagen, it will be exposed. Collagen, among other things, will convert factor 12 to factor 12A. So from 12, we go to 11. From 11, we already mentioned, Right from nine, uh, nine will now 
working with factor eight as a cofactor will now convert factor 10 to factor 10A. 10A again through thrombin to thrombin, thrombin fibrinogen to fibrin. Yeah. So APTT used to measure the intrinsic pathway and heparin, we say it acts more on the intrinsic pathway. Yeah. Guys, you said intrinsic is? APTT. Intrinsic. Yeah, intrinsic is APTT. And for extrinsic? PT. PT, oh. Yeah, you. yeah, you can remember it by the the shorter pathway has a short word PT. The longer pathway has a long word APTT. That's that's just my my system. Mm, nice. So um, that's the the coagulation cascade here summarized, and we have done warfarin. So if someone else take us through the other. Anticoagulant drugs, the antithrombin indirect inhibitors, and all that. Okay. Uh, Atma, you can go. Okay, the in indirect thrombin inhibitors are the heparin and the low molecular weight hep um, heparins. The heparin and low molecular weight are renoxoparin, fonda fondaparin, nox. And for the uh, thrombin inhibitors, the bicatrin for factor factor ten A inhibitors, we have the apixaban, tetraxapan, indoxapan, and then uh, so like if someone has a better explanation, because I'm just I'm not sure of the the mechanism of action and all. Is one who can summarize it for us in a better way. Okay, let me read out this slide. Uh, they classified and uh, the ones used in vivo. Under that, we have a parental anticoagulants. Under this, still we have in, uh, we, okay, for example, we have indirect thrombin inhibitors. Example is heparin, low molecular weight heparin, fondaparnit, oh, I don't know, then dinoparoid. Then we have direct thrombin, lepirudin, bivalirudin. Okay, next we have oral anticoagulants. We have coumarin derivatives. This hydroxycoumarin, that is the coumarol. We have warfarin sodium, acinocoumarol, ethylibri, this coumarol acetate. Then oral direct thrombin inhibitors. Example is the bigatrin. The bigatrin uh, take zillet. Uh, and then direct factor 10A inhibitors, rivaroxaban. Oh. 
then the one used in vitro is uh, under that you have a heparin and b calcium complexing agents e.g sodium citrate sodium oxalate yeah Okay, a side note for the low molecular weight heparin, it can't be, we can't use protamine sulfate, just an addition as an antidote. Uh, you can't use protamine sulfate for the low molecular weight so heparins, those enoxaparins. You like you can't use it as an antidote. Protamine sulfate only works against heparin. So should I go to the next question? No. Okay, hypertriglyceridemia responds well to all of the following niacin, phenofibrates, gemifroprazil, and atovastatin. What do you guys think? Pardon, Nugal, kindly. Uh, number 58. Answer with explanation why this uh this one this person does don't. Okay, uh, I'd say at of a starting because the fibrates that's a uh, phenofibrate B and C they target hyper the triglycerides and niacin targets both uh, both the triglyceride and cholesterol. But at of a starting, it's only for uh, cholesterol. Okay, so for you said niacin uh, works both against triglyceride and cholesterol. Yeah. And the and the other ones. Uh. I said uh, uh, the fibrates are majorly target the triglycerides and atavastatin targets uh, the cholesterol, but niacin targets both uh, the tri uh, triglycerides and cholesterol. So I'll choose atavastatin. And also the other like niacin and and these fibrates, they directly affect the triglycerides while for atovastatin, they, it inhibits like the HMG CoA reductase. No, sorry. Yeah. HMG CoA reductase. So it has like an indirect, like that would be my reasoning. For the other three, it directly affects <clears throat> the triglyceride levels.
So is that okay with everyone? Or anyone who has something to add on that? I'm just asking a question. Is niacin not a vitamin? It is a vitamin, but it also decreases. Uh, um, it inhibits uh, hormone sensitive lipase, so it decreases LDL. But it is a water soluble uh, vitamin. Can we discuss all the classifications of until it begins? Yeah, maybe we can remind ourselves what we discussed last time. Okay. Actually, those drugs, they function by either reducing the production of lipoprotein or by removing, by increasing the removal from the blood, or they aim to decrease the plasma cholesterol. And then the classes, they are HMG coa reductase inhibitors, which inhibit, inhibit HMG coa reductase mm -hmm. enzyme. This enzyme to prevent the conversion of, um, of cholesterol to mevalonate, and that step is the rate limiting step for cholesterol synthesis. And then there are fibric acid derivatives. Um, for mechanism of action on fibric acid derivatives is uh, for HMG coa reductase, they're all the statins, atovastatin, and all of that. And they, they stimulate um, beta oxidation of fatty acids in mitochondria. So they, affect, they basically affect the metabolism of um, uh, the antilipidemics. So when they do that, they decrease the plasma levels of triglycerides. And in this one, there are examples is um, gemfibrozil. Actually, they are, they, they are in two classes. There, there is ones that are, that are halogenated and there are ones that are halogenated. But I don't know the examples of the halogenated ones, but the non-halogenated is gemfibrozil. Fibrozil actually. And then the other class is um, the bile acid sequesterants that um, they they uh, they exchange anions um, such as chloride ions for bile acids and then um, they they act on the enterohepatic circulation. Then the bile acids that are produced um, to replace um, okay what they did what they actually do is they exchange anions such as chloride ions for bile acids. By doing that, they bind bile acids and sequester them from the enterohepatic system. Then the bile acids are, are produced to replace those that are already been lost. So the body uses cholesterol to make bile acids and then reduces the amount of LDLs that was already in circulation. I hope I'm making sense. And then, example is um, the one that was in the question the other day, I forgot the name. Uh, um, it was what chloro what? That's those are the only classes I remember. Yeah, that's that's the bile acid sequesterant. Those are the three classes I know of antilipidemic. I don't know if there's another class or anyone might add that onto. Okay. Can you go on or someone has something to add to that? Okay, uh concomitant administration of theophylline and erythromycin in asthmatic patients. 
Hello? may lead to yeah go on Swan. do you want to add on something yeah we can we can have cholesterol absorption inhibitors like is it my can you hear me yeah yeah we can yeah, I was talking about is it my inhibiting cholesterol absorption as another class. Okay. Thank you. Uh, con comitant administration of theophylin and erythromycin in asthmatic patient can lead to arrhythmias, bronchoconstriction, hypertension, infertility. So um, erythromycin is an enzyme inhibitor, right? So if we administer it with theophylin, that will reduce the metabolism of theophylin, leading to high levels of theophylin. So it will exacerbate the effects of um, theophylin, such as seizures, nausea, vomiting, irritability, arrhythmias, irregular heartbeats, and all that. So I think the answer is A. Uh, what do you guys think? I think so too. Yeah, yeah for the pylon relaxes the airway, so bronchoconstriction is out. Mm -hmm. Patma? Um, erythromycin, it inhibits the metabolism of theophylline in the liver, so it leads the elevated theophylline in the blood. So, uh, the some of the toxicities in nausea, it's right. I, mean, I agree with you, it's arrhythmias. So, seizure is another adverse effect that will be exacerbated. Yeah. Okay, that's... Please uh, scroll down. Uh, someone wrote, uh, Theophile Nazanoro, T-I. What does T-I mean? Therapeutic index. Oh, okay. So, so uh, at all uh, costs, the combination of these two should be avoided. Uh, drugs that produce high sterling rates in patients with gastro, gastro, gastrophageal reflux disease GAD are H2 receptor antagonists, proton pump inhibitors, antiacids, and prostaglandins. Mm -hmm. I think Dr. Sophia in her webinar told us PPIs are the way and the truth. Oh God. Yeah. Okay. Had had we covered this um antiacids? Have we discussed discussed this before? Uh not in a discussion, just in our webinar. Okay, so the answer is protein pump inhibitors. Uh, we can talk about the H2 receptor antagonists, antiacids, and all these GI medications. No one is willing to take us through that.
okay uh, we can start with antiacids so antiacids generally from the time it's just that it neutralizes the stomach acid so it helps in the indigestion at by an acid reflux and all that um for proton pump inhibitors uh they uh they reduce the production of stomach acid through uh inhibition of the the hydrogen something potent pump so dm yeah someone can correct me i'm not sure of the pump that it was inhibiting hydrogen so, hydrogen okay so uh it reduces the production of uh, acids through inhibition of the potassium you said potassium sodium pump and the examples called uh, examples uh, are esomeprazole and omeprazole. We had said earlier esomeprazole is safe in pregnancy. For H2 blockers, uh, they also um, block the production of acid through blocking the H2 um, receptors in the, in the stomach. And the example is ranitidine. Someone died on that. We're almost done, so let's finish with that question at least. Okay, let's talk about savings. Mm -hmm. They're used to when um, the body immune system reacts to uh, and it and uh, then the body it's, it triggers histamine. So antihistamines they work by blocking the histamine receptors and reducing the symptoms of um, allergic symptoms. The two types there is first generation antihistamines and second generation antihistamines. Um, this sec first generation, they're the one who, which has sedation effect. I think the newer one is the second generation. They don't have that sedative effects. And um, uh, example of first is promethazine and second generation is um, citrazine. And they used in diseases like allergic rhinitis. Uh, um, uh, also, they used in um, is it bacterial conjunctivitis? It's used in one of the conjunctivitis, and then they bind to H one and H two receptors. Um, wait, which has? Let me confirm something. Yeah, H1, the, um, the newer second generation H1 antihistamines are more selective for peripheral histamine receptors and have less side effects. As I was saying, uh, it has less side effects of seditions and drowsiness and all that. And the H1 receptors, they don't cross the blood brain barrier. Yeah, that's pretty much. And then they used. Allergic craniitis is one of them, I'm sure of. And, and bacterial conjunctivitis, or it's allergic actually, it's allergic conjunctivitis. Um, if there is angioedema, um, atopic dermatitis, there's so many uses. Yeah. Thank you, Fatma. Uh, okay. So, should we do the last question? Because we had discussed it, Lisa, more we stop it at that. Uh, yes, please. Yes, please, Dr. Okay, okay. which will be following. It's not a clinical feature of syphilis. Maculopapular rash, you had said that is a 
a common symptom of uh, secondary syphilis, if I'm not wrong, uh, periostasis, Hutchins, incisors, anemia. Well, guys, you can enlighten us on that because, yeah, I only remember you said the secondary syphilis uh, common symptom is macular papilla rash. Uh, hey, you're, you're painting me in a bad light, like I'm a syphilis expert. Yeah. <laughs> oh, <laughs> not you really. Know, you we are you the one who's bad. No, no. Still anyway. in a bad way. You had taken us through uh, syphilis. Ah, yeah, I do. That was uh, on a light note, on a light note. Uh, so for this, I'd go with anemia because maculopapula rash is there. Then I know we didn't mention about periostitis and Hutchinson's uh, disease or incisors. So uh, let me let me display that as the last thing of the day. Let uh, me, please do. Yeah. So. Uh, let, I'll start with the Hutchinson's because I have an image for Hutchinson's. I don't have an image for the periostitis. But Hutchinson's disease is a congenital. <clears throat> uh, or Hutchinson's and the periostitis, they are both congenital syphilis, whereby we've passed the uh, triponema pallidum to the to the child. So in Hutchinson's disease, the teeth will be like, uh, I don't know how to describe. Uh, let me just show the picture here. Yeah, here it is. The teeth, especially you can, you can see the incisors here, they, they are like, uh, like they are holes or that they are dense. I think dense is the right word. They are dense in the teeth. Now this is a sign of congenital syphilis, like also called Hutchinson's teeth or Hutchinson's in incisors. Uh, I don't know if perhaps if this image is not clear, let me just display another image here. Guys, please, my internet is breaking. Uh, I'm saying, yeah, I think uh, in the Hutchinson's teeth, this is how the it's the teeth or it's the teeth that are affected. You can see how these teeth are appearing. This is of a child born with congenital syphilis. See, like this, this they are this dense. So just to take you back to this image, yeah, you can see that. So that's one of the signs of uh, congenital syphilis that uh, Hutchinson's teeth. The other one is that periostitis. Periostitis is now whereby the bone has been affected. Mm, I don't know. Yeah, here it is. It's 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 been stated here that uh, the perichondritis and peri they can lead to deformities of the nose and of the metaphysis of the lower extremities. So in periostitis, it's whereby the bone has been affected in such a manner that uh, uh, it will be, the bone will not be properly formed or will not, ha will not be properly fortificated to not have the proper fortification, right? And now for the periostitis, it can easily be mistaken for syphilis. Yeah, ah, not for syphilis, for rickets. Yeah. Otherwise, those are the two major, those are the two major congenital syphilis injections. That's Hutchinson's teeth and this periostitis. Yeah. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Ah, welcome, welcome. So, and you had earlier mentioned maculopapular rash. So, that's um, 
the name is the answer. Yeah, 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 yeah. So I need the answer, yeah. Okay. Thank you so much. Are you mm, welcome? I think you can my, stop at uh, that. Chai benefited from my syphilis. <laughs> <laughs> I hope so. <laughs>